So we're here to um, hear this wonderful presentation from one of our board members, Ken Bauer, about stream restoration, sort of the, um, the dirty facts behind uh, what is a, a common practice these days. I've known Ken for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and he has been passionate about this subject that whole time. Um, and I'm just very excited about it. He's gonna tell us a little bit more about his history with this and his background, so I'll just let him get started. My name is Ken Bauer. Thanks very much for your time and your patience. A little bit about my background. I am the immediate past president of the West Montgomery County Citizens Association and founder of the Coalition to Prevent Stream Destruction. I'm a current member of the Montgomery County Water Quality Advisory Group appointed by County Executive Elrich. I'm rejoining the board of the Maryland Native Plant Society. I'm a founder of the Wasp Branch Watershed Alliance and I'm a long time volunteer Montgomery Parks Weed Warrior Supervisor and was certified as a Maryland natural, um, Master Naturalist. But to be clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those organizations tonight. So I have three different alternate titles for this presentation. The first is Stream Restorations, The Inconvenient Truth with apologies to Al Gore. Second one is Crimes Against Nature. These are harsh words, but I think you will agree with me by the end of this presentation. And then finally, the greenwashing of stream restorations. And if you're not familiar with the term, greenwashing is defined as the process of conveying a false, false impression or providing misleading information about how products or practices are environmentally sound. This is what the tobacco and oil industries have historically done. Um, and because of its mis misleading name, it's understandable that many people misunderstand the, this subject and support so-called stream restorations without knowing the full truth. After all, with a name like Stream restoration, what could possibly be that, right? Uh, there's a reason why the billion dollar stream restoration industry doesn't call them engineered drainage ditches. While more accurate, it just doesn't sound as good, does it? So the purpose of this presentation is to get you angry. Hopefully not at me, but at the idea of letting the multi-billion dollar stream restoration corporations and their government enablers destroy natural areas in Maryland, along with the native plants in their footprint. This background photo was a photo taken by Rod Simmons, I'm sure a lot of you know. It's a so-called stream restoration project in Alexandria, Virginia. And it's an example of the terrible damage done when heavy equipment and chainsaws are used in our natural areas for stream restorations. I feel like I should preface this presentation by warning that some viewers may be disturbed by these images. So be forewarned. Why is stream restoration a topic for the Maryland Native Plant Society? The mission of the Maryland Native, Maryland Native Plant Society is to promote awareness, appreciation, and conservation of Maryland's native plants and their habitats. The dirty little secret is that so-called stream restorations destroy native plants and their habitats in a big way. We all love native plants. That's why we're here tonight. Uh, unless we only want to see native plants in an arboretum or a, a park that we have to drive to someday, we need to protect the natural habitats that they're in, that are in and around our urban and suburban areas, even if they are in a somewhat degraded condition. According to Maryland Department of Natural Resources, a national study says that one of the biggest threats to biodiversity and imperiled plants and animals is habitat degradation and destruction. Others may argue that climate change is the bigger, is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss, so let's just call it a tie. I'm going to cut right to the chase in case you get bored, and uh, some of you may be old enough to recognize this chase scene from the movie Bullet with Steve McQueen. Uh, by the end of the presentation, people always ask, well, what can I do? So I'm going to tell you right up front what you can do. You can contact our elected officials at the local, state, and federal level and ask them to introduce a bill to ban stream restorations. This is not a radical position. We banned EDT. We banned thalidomide. We banned lead and gas. We banned lawn pesticides, at least in Montgomery County. And uh, so there's no reason why we can't expect that we, can, we, we, we can't ban uh, stream restorations. So this presentation explains why this is so important. Here are the topics I'll discuss. I'm going to define stream restorations. I'm going to explain why they're done, the inconvenient truth about stream restorations. I'm going to talk about the eroded uh, gullies and stream banks, um, why stream restorations fail, what the collateral damage is, uh, how stream restorations promote global warming, a cost issue, a little bit about what the science says, and then talk about the alternatives to stream restoration. This background picture is a so-called stream restoration in a Montgomery Park, if you can believe it, uh, that, that shows the destruction caused by these projects. This huge tractor is sitting where the stream used to be, and I'll tell you uh, later on where the stream went. 
So what is the stream restoration? Stream restorations are construction projects, pure and simple. There are several different types of stream restorations, but the most common ones are engineering projects done to try to stabilize eroding streams by using heavy equipment, such as the excavator shown here, to modify a stream channel. And this typically involves a mix of straightening or changing a stream's natural meander pattern, placing heavy boulders to armor plate sections of the stream, as shown here, scraping away stream bank soil, using soil stabilization mats that may or may not be biodegradable, dumping fill material in the stream channel to raise its level, or even filling the stream channel and moving it to a different location. So why are stream restorations done? The primary reason stream restorations are done uh, is that uh, they're done by jurisdictions to help them meet their MS4 permit. The MS4, MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System. And an MS4 permit is required for jurisdictions that have separate pipes for stormwater than for their sewer system. The MS4 permit system is an effort to clean up the Chesapeake Bay by reducing the amount of really three things, sediment, nutrient, and phosphorus that enter, enter the bay from point sources. And the point sources in this case are the stormwater pipes that dump into streams. The MS4 permit is issued by MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment, under authorization of the federal um, EPA, Environmental Protection, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. And it requires local jurisdictions like Montgomery County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, um, and, and many others, as well as some large agencies like Montgomery Parks and the State Highway Administration to reduce the amount of sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus, pollutants as they're called, that are sent down to the Chesapeake Bay through their stormwater systems. So by the way, there's no these permits um, do not require an improvement in in-stream biology, and they don't, by the way. That's not their purpose. And that's why stream restorations have to be signed off by the Army Corps of Engineers, not a Corps of, Eng not a Corps of Environmentalists, if such a thing existed. But jurisdictions sell these projects to the public with the promise that they will improve the, improve the environment, which is not supported by the science or, or even by casual observation, as I will show you. Uh, for example, the uh, Montgomery County website uh, states that stream restorations restore aquatic ecosystems. That is simply not a true statement, as I will show you. And it, all, it, it also completely ignores the environmental damage and environmental destruction that's done. The other reason stream restorations are done is for so-called mitigation projects. And I call these James Bond projects because they basically give developers a license to kill. So what that means is that if an environmentally destructive construction project um, destroys a stream or wetlands in one location, for example, site A on the left-hand side by company A, then company A can supposedly mitigate that damage by paying another company, company B, to do an environmentally destructive stream restoration or wetland creation project in a relatively, eco, eco, relatively healthy ecosystem in a completely different location. So this is adding insult to injury. First, so-called mitigation is based on the false premise that bulldozers can actually restore, whatever that means, streams and wetlands in location B, which really can't be done. And the second false premise is that, you know, is that this is even a fair exchange, that it's perfectly fine to allow destruction of streams and wetlands in one place and supposedly make up for that in an entirely different location. So federal law uh, requires in-kind or like-for-like, -like, um, as it's called, if you, uh, so that is if you damage stream A on the left, you have to undamage or fix stream B on the right. And typically this means trying to fix the effects of urban stormwater runoff that's eroded the other stream at location B. Well, the point is you can't undamage a stream by doing these so-called stream restorations. So I'm sure we all know in, uh, in, this, uh, in this group that our, our, natural, uh, our natural systems are in decline. This graphics uh, just shows bird losses over time, which is just one of many indicators. Uh, we know that insects and pollinators are in decline. Our watershed health is generally, and, uh, is generally a, a, a poor, not just in terms of the water quality and aquatic, and aquatic life, but also the land. These declines are directly tied to land use, habitat loss, and habitat degradation. And just to give you one example, the Columbia Association Mitigation Project, if approved, will do a stream restoration that will destroy 33,000 feet of stream and up to 133 acres of forest. So the inconvenient truth is that contrary to the propaganda and the greenwashing by the multi-billion dollar stream restoration industry and their government enablers, 
is that stream restorations don't actually restore anything, not the streams themselves, either physically or biologically, and especially not the whole ecology of the entire construction site, which is always way beyond the stream itself, as you can see here. This is a so-called stream restoration in Chevy Chase, Maryland, at Audubon Natural Society. This is, for those of you who know the area, it's south of Jones, uh, Jones Bridge Road. This area uh, used to be fully wooded. So the rhetorical question is, how are fish and salamanders and other aquatic organisms supposed to move up and down this so-called restored stream? And as you can see, the stream side plant community was totally wiped out. And even though this was on private property, Montgomery County is taking an S4 permit credit for this project. The shocking fact is that gov government enablers are embedded at Montgomery, uh, at, at Maryland Department of the Environment, and in Anne Arundel, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Montgomery, Carroll, Charles, Frederick, Harford, and Howard County. All these jurisdictions have stream restorations that are being planned as we speak for their new or their next MS4 permits. The definition of restore is to bring back to a former state. You can restore a piece of furniture, but you simply cannot bring a stream ecosystem back to its former pre-colonial pre state with chainsaws, heavy equipment, and replanting a few trees. The logic of stream restoration proponents seems to be, we must destroy the stream to restore the stream. How, how perverse and Orwellian is that? The stream restoration proponents would have us ignore the environmental damage that we can see with our own eyes. And, and the stream restoration itself, the name uh, itself, is a big lie since they don't address the root cause of stream deg degradation, which is uncontrolled stormwater from impervious services like roads and roofs in urban and suburban areas. I'm going to show you several more examples of so-called stream restorations to show how they destroy our natural areas. This is a stream restoration at Asbury Methodist Village in Montgomery County. It's an overhead view, uh, presumably from a drone in the wintertime, and you can get an idea of scale uh, compared to the, the, the trees at the bottom. This is what our state allows to be called a restored stream, believe it or not. And just to be clear, I'm in no way opposed to infrastructure protection or repair projects, such as protecting uh, undercut roads or exposed sewer lines as shown here on the left and, the, and in the middle. These are necessary infrastructure repair projects. They are not stream restorations. People confuse the two things. Uh, and note that if an infra infrastructure repair project like these are done, they won't get MS4 permit credits. Why? Because MDE says these are not stream restorations. They're infrastructure repair projects or inf infrastructure protection projects. Issues like these can be fixed with spot repairs, not the hundreds or thousands of feet of in-stream construction proposed in most stream restoration projects. Likewise, projects like daylighting buried streams and removing concrete culverts, such as the one on the right, are admirable, pro admirable projects, but these also are not considered stream restorations by NDE, and they get no MS4 permit credit. These are photos of the Falls Reach restoration project in Potomac, Maryland. The before picture on the left shows a perfect, perfectly fine natural stream. Yes, it has a bit of erosion as all natural streams do, and no urban or suburban stream is in pristine condition. The small um, insert, inserts in the middle show heavy equipment that was used for this project. And the after photo on the right shows that the stream restoration completely destroyed the forest community in its, foot, in its footprint by scraping the forest floor bare. They destroy the natural character of the stream by straightening it out in sections, armor plating sections with stones, creating artificial rock dams that block the movement of aquatic organisms. And um, so just, just um, to let you know, I was at this site again last fall and, and the stream bank on the left-hand side was completely covered in non-native invasive Japanese stilt grass and hairy joint grass. Here's another example of the utter destruction caused by so-called stream restorations. This one in the city of Rockville in the upper Watts branch. The riparian or streamside buffer has been completely clear cut and the stream channel has been turned into a muddy mosh pit. As you may, may know, riparian buffers are streamside vegetative buffers which provide food and cover for wildlife. Riparian buffers also provide shade, which lowers the water temperature that's required by some sensitive aquatic organisms and which allows the water to hold more oxygen. They also, they also slow out-of-bank out flood water. Not here anymore. 
And where's the stream, you ask? Well, what, what happens uh, to the stream during these construction projects? This is an example of what they, uh, what they do from back at the Falls Reach project. The entire Falls, Falls Reach stream was forced to run through this black pipe during construction. How hot do you think the water gets? And how do you think the frogs and the turtles and the other animals access the water? And it gets worse, as I'll tell you later. This is the Whetstone Run project in Bloom Park in Gaithersburg, before on the left and after on the right. Again, the total environmental uh, uh, destruction um, you can see for yourself. At the bottom, you can see the uh, type of heavy equipment used. And there's a per perverse incentive to construct more artificial sinuosity in some of these streams, since these project projects get MS4 permit credit based on their linear feet. Uh, the insert in the upper right hand side shows the armor plating of the stream bank that's done with boulders. So this is like cutting down a bit of our own Amazon forest. This is the lungs of the state of Maryland that we're cutting down. And what does this do to global, global warming when the carbon sequestration of the original forest is wiped out? This is the solitaire court, so-called stream restoration in Gaithersburg. On the left, standing at this location um, before the construction, none of the houses that you can see in the, in, the, in the back were visible through the narrow repair and or stream side forest. On the right, you can see that the former forest is now a pile of logs. At the pre-construction walkthrough, I innocently asked the city program manager, what will happen to the little animals like the frogs and the turtles and the salamanders? And that person said with a straight face, oh, they'll just move away and come back after the construction as if they'll go to Ocean City for a vacation and then come back. And I'm not making that up. They even posted this on their web, uh, their website of frequently asked questions as I extracted from the bottom. To add insult to injury, the engineers who designed this project actually filled in part of the natural stream channel and dug a new channel at a different location that, that they presumably think is better than nature. Uh, a similar filling and moving of the stream channel is done uh, on the Glenstone Museum property in Montgomery County. This is just the height of arrogance. This is another view of the solitary court before and after construction started. What was the forest on the left is now the big pile of logs you see on the right. And the, the companies and their uh, government enablers, they, they cynically say that this, is, this isn't a clear cut because they've let a few trees stand it, right? This is another view of the Solitaire Court project from further downstream. And again, this was a fully wooded natural areas, natural area. No place in the state is safe. This is an example of a so-called stream restoration in Baltimore County in Scotts Level Branch. And you can, uh, we'll give you a copy of this and you can click on some of the links to get more detail about these, these locations. These are before and after pictures of the, uh, of the Tacoma branch restoration in Montgomery County. Again, you can see that the natural character of the forest has been wiped out, including the coarse woody, de woody debris, as it's called, like the fallen tree on the left that woodpeckers and other animals depend on. Plus the disturbed soil opens up these areas like this to non-native invasives. This uh, slide from Rod Simmons shows the stream restoration in the Winkler Botanical Preserve in Alexandria. I use this photo uh, on the left on my cover slide. The, locate, the photo on the right shows the same location five years later, covered in non-native non -native invasives, including Japanese stiltgrass and many others. So Rod says, uh, quote, stream construction projects are major vectors for the growth and spread of non-native invasive plants that completely engulf sites following major soil disturbance. This was a fully wooded section of Long Branch, a Stream Valley Park in Tacoma Park, Maryland, done by, done by Montgomery Parks. It was conveyed into an engineered stormwater conveyance. And I recently learned that the director of Montgomery Parks is an engineer, which explains a lot. This is a completed stream restoration in Columbia. Uh, these are all in Maryland um, at various locations. This is exactly what you can expect if the new proposed Lake Elkhorn project in Columbia is allowed to happen. Because of the misleading name stream restoration and the greenwashing done by the vendor, maybe it's understandable that the Columbia Association Board misunderstands and therefore supports the Lake, or Lake Elkhorn stream restoration without knowing the full truth. This is another previous stream restoration site in Columbia where they ran bulldozers right down the middle of a beautiful forest to create an, an area as wide as about a six lane highway. And, and this sign is something like out of a George Orwell novel. It says, restore, re, re, replant, 
renew. This destroyed a lush forest that shaded the, the stream, which is on the far left, and created a barren, sun-baked open field. How was this restored? How was this um, renewed? How were the few replanted saplings supposed to replace the mature forest? Well, not in certainly my lifetime. So as long as I'm, I'm on Columbia, this is one of the stream sections proposed to be destroyed by a stream restoration by the Lake Elkhorn Mitigation Project I previously mentioned. Those beech trees are an indicator of an older forest and they'll be toast along with up to 50 feet on either side of the stream. Look at the huge American beech tree at the far, on the far right, just uh, at the edge of the photograph. But this is the stream restoration in Chevy Chase, Maryland. This is another view um, of the, the Audubon Natural Society uh, stream restoration. This was a fully wooded area. And um, on the left is, is the excavator that they used. And the, so the rhetorical question is, how can fish and salamanders move, move up and down this, this so-called restored stream? So I hope your jaws have all hit the floor by now. This is a list of just some of the so-called stream restoration projects being planned or already taking place in Montgomery County and Howard County. There are certainly many more uh, out there across the state, as I'll show you on the next slide. And we need folks in, in, you know, in other counties and cities to protest their own proposed projects. This is the list of counties that are slated to have stream restorations done as part of the latest round of MS4 permits. The large jurisdictions, the ones in black, which are Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery, and Prince George's, are already past their public comment periods. Their new five-year MS4 permits became effective last November 5th, but it's still not, it's, it's not too late. You can still contact your county officials and ask them to halt these stream restorations. In red are the medium-sized jurisdictions that have a public comment period that's open until June 9th for their new permits. So these are Carroll, Charles, Frederick, Harford, and Howard County. And you can use the link, and again, we'll give you copies of the presentation. You can use the link on the right or Google Maryland Department of the Environment MS4 permits to read the actual draft permits. And you can send public comments until June 9th to Raymond Barr with MDE. And again, there's, there's a, we'll get you his, uh, if you ask, we'll, we'll get you uh, the link. And we ask that you, or I ask that you write to say that you oppose the use of stream restorations and that the MS4 per permit should be met only with non-destructive upland stormwater control practices that, we'll, that I will talk about in a bit. One of the objections I get from, from some folks, and especially from the stream restoration industry and our gov government enablers, is that we have to do stream restorations because of the terrible erosion gullies and the eroded stream banks. But these are just engineers looking for places to play with their bulldozers. This is a slide from Montgomery, County's DE, uh, Montgomery County DEP's Stream Restoration 101 presentation, as they call it. And they use this slide as an example of why stream restorations must be done. It shows before and after pictures of the Hollywood stream restoration. The, the before picture on the top shows a perfectly fine looking natural stream. Yeah, it has a bit of erosion, which is a natural process for all stream. And yes, it's probably more eroded due to urban stormwater runoff. The lower picture shows the results. Bulldozers scraped the forest floor bare. Uh, they armor-plated sections of the stream with boulders. They removed a large stretch of riparian streamside forest. And then they replanted a few saplings. Uh, the after photo on the, on the bottom, it looks like a sanitized nature land theme park. And this cost $1.7 million. The sad thing is that this money could have been used to actually control the stormwater from the roads and roofs at its source, meaning outside the stream valley before it can actually fire a hose into the stream. Plus, the stream restora restoration advocates, they fail to mention that this is only a temporary fix. It's all going to get washed away by future storms, and I'll show you pictures of this later. The multi-billion dollar stream restoration industry loves these projects because these are the gifts that keep on giving. These companies make a fortune on each project, and they know that because the money wasn't spent to control the stormwater before it gets into the stream, these will all get eroded out again. And these companies will get paid to do the same thing in several more years. And guess what? The stream restoration standard is to only give a one-year guarantee. And the cycle will, will repeat itself until the end of time. These projects are the proverbial cash cow for the stream restoration industry. So what do I propose to do about the steeply eroded stream banks? Well, the answer is don't do anything 
in the stream channel itself. If you, if you control the stormwater, meaning out of, out of the stream valley, before it gets into the stream, there's no longer any need to do a so-called stream restoration in the stream channel. Once the stormwater is controlled upland, before it gets into the stream, a major source of erosion has been eliminated. Then the stream, the steep stream banks, like the one shown here, will eventually self-stabilize over time to what's called the equilibrium bank slope, as suggested by the green line, without spending a dime. Gravity is our friend here, and it doesn't cost a cent. Without the, fire, without the fire hose from upland stormwater, there'll be a gradual sloughing off of dirt until the slope stabilizes on its own at no cost to taxpayers. That's the way gravity works. It's a natural healing process. And vegetation will come in and further stabilize the, the, the slopes. And that process can be assisted with plantings if, desi if desired. Some people, uh, including um, uh, the, 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 our, our friends in government, say this is an urgent problem. We have to fix these, gull these gullies because the trees are being undercut and will fall over like the one in this photo. Well, statement, statements like that are cynical scare tactics. This damage, took dam this, this damage took decades to occur, and there's no urgency that requires an urgent fix. The development that caused this, the erosion didn't happen overnight. So why are we being told by government officials that stream restorations must be done as soon as possible to, quote, stop the bleeding or, quote, repair the wound? Plus, the natural loss of, of a few dozen trees due to natural stabilization is a tiny number compared to the guaranteed hundreds or thousands of streams that will cut back, that will be, that will be cut down during a stream restoration project. I've heard stream restoration proponents say that this is a public safety issue, that someone could fall off a cliff like this. I say, well, put up some signs, maybe a fence. This would be a lot cheaper than the $800,000 spent on this project. So even though it's common sense that eroded, uh, eroded gullies and stream, uh, steep stream banks will self-recover and self-stabilize, what's the scientific evidence? Well, here's a quote from the review, review of a paper that looked to see what would, what would happen to steeply eroded stream banks if you control the stormwater before it can even get into the stream. They say, quote, it, it is expected that with the reduced hydraulics from erosive flows within the catchment, meaning the upland watershed that feeds this, this area, these banks will continue a trajectory towards stability as indicated by the reduced angles and vegetation establishment. This was a, a study done in Carroll County. The before, the before picture on the left shows the steep stream banks, and on the right is the same location four years after the upland stormwater control. And you can see that the self-recovery or natural heal, healing or self-stabilization as the stream, as the soil sloughs off, and the slope of the stream bank becomes more gentle, um, which is pointed uh, uh, to the yellow area. And this can be, and you can see the vegetation coming back in, and this vegetation can be supplemented, supplemented with plantings. So the bottom line is we need to recognize the, abil uh, recognize the ability of nature to heal itself without the use of bulldozers and chainsaws. So again, since degradation like the picture on the left was allowed to happen for decades without any action being taken, why are, being, why are we being told that these projects are, are an emergency? They're not. And we can like, we'll let nature and gravity help us once we, once we control the stormwater outside the stream valley. So just for your reference, these are some quotes from the actual reference paper that I used on the last slide, and you can look at that at your leisure. This is a hot link to the paper, again, for future use. As I alluded to previously, to add insult, insult to injury, since stormwater is not being, being controlled at its source, all these stream restorations fail or will fail, especially given the more intense storms we expect due to global warming. All the rocks, boulders, filter, soil stabil stabilization mats brought under these projects will eventually get blown out by future storms. And by blowout, I simply mean, uh, it simply means the failure of the armor plating and the stream bank engineering done by a stream restoration to withstand these large rainstorms. This renders them useless and is a waste of taxpayer money. The picture on the left is, Joseph, is Joseph's branch stream restoration in Kensington, and it shows how the large boulders that were used to stabilize the stream bank are being totally ripped out of place. The, uh, the, the, the couple of circled rocks that I show are probably 300 pounds each. 
All of these are being dislodged by uncontrolled stormwater that hasn't been controlled at its source. And the insert on the bottom left shows this uncontrolled stormwater at the same location during a rainstorm. The picture on the right is Cabin Branch uh, in Bethesda, shows how the uncontrolled stormwater just erodes out behind um, this armor plating. It, it renders it useless. So that's why I say that these stream restorations are only a temporary fix to stream bank erosion since stream bank since the stormwater uh, is not being controlled at its source. And this is why these stream restorations are a total waste of our tax money. Uh, this shows, a, uh, shows blown out armor plating along Long Branch in Tacoma Park in a Montgomery County, in a Montgomery Park. You can see the huge size of these boulders, size of these boulders compared to the people. And I estimate the one on the bottom right is a, probably about 5,000 pounds. This is a, an example from Fairfax County. This is, this is in all of our jurisdictions. Um, shows the, 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 the the, this imbricated uh, brick, uh, imbricated stone wall, as it's called, uh, just being uh, 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 degraded uh, because the stormwater is not being controlled. This shows a blowout uh, of a section of a stream bank uh, armoring in Little Bennett Regional Park, Regional Park, Regional Park in Montgomery County. This is Snake Den Branch in Potomac, Maryland. Uh, on the right bank, you can see the, the blown out area. The water has gone over and around the walk wall has continued to erode the stream bank behind it. You can see the exposed plastic geotextile fabric, which once it's exposed to UV light will break down and add to the microplastics pro problem. This is Lower Booth Creek, uh, in, also in Potomac. This was an, a stream restoration that originally cost $700,000. After, after the total destruction um, of this once forested area by the stream restoration, the website says, quote, Storm damage occurred very soon after construction, initiating structural failures. So great. So the photo on the left shows some of the damage to the original stream restoration at one spot, and then the restoration project, and maybe it should be called the so-called stream restoration of the so-called stream restoration, cost an additional $3.6 million, a total waste of tax dollars. It's like throwing money in the trash can. This is, this is another example of the stream restoration credo, which seems to be you have to destroy nature to fix nature. And we don't care how much it costs. The photo on the right was after the repair. And I don't know uh, which location, uh, if it was the same location as the one on the left, because it wasn't labeled on the website. And again, the contractors only guarantee these stream restoration, restorations for one year. Uh, when they fail after that, we, the taxpayers, pick up the bill. Here are more pictures of blown out uh, uh, blowouts, which they call stream restoration failures here. Restoration failures here. This is from a Chesapeake Bay program expert panel report um, that promotes stream restorations on one hand while acknowledging that they fail on the other hand. So keep in mind that MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment, looks to the recommendations from these Chesapeake Bay program expert panel reports, which promote stream restorations. And guess what? Some of the authors of this report work for the multi-billion dollar stream restoration industry. This is a blatant conflict of interest, which merits, in my opinion, a good article by a reporter uh, and, and certainly an, an official inquiry in Annapolis. So I've shown you pictures of the collateral damage done to forests when heavy equipment is run through our natural areas and parks. But the stream restoration corporations and their government sponsors, they say, don't worry, we're gonna, re we're gonna plant some trees and streams when we're done. However, after the construction is done, trying to replant a forest is like trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You just can't do it. No amount of planting can reconstitute the destroyed natural forest community. And why? Because a forest is more than just trees and shrubs. This is high school biology, a complex web of interactions between fauna, flora, geology, and hydrology that interact in natural areas is irreplaceable and can't be reconstructed and recreated by engineering projects using bulldozers, trucked in material, and some replanted saplings. Let's, let's revisit the Gaithersburg Western Run project. Please don't strain your eyes trying to see the replanted trees uh, that are pointed to by the red arrows. And we're, we're told, don't worry, this will all grow back. But you know, this is like giving, giving over your dining room table and chairs to be restored, and then being told you'll get them back in 100 years. 
This is exactly what the stream restoration proponents are doing, except that they wave their arms and say, everything will grow back in a, few, in a couple of years. You know, you, you can restore table and chairs, but you can't really restore a stream and it's riparian ecosystem with bulldozers. These are just a tiny sampling of all the Maryland native wildflowers and small animals, which are called charismatic minifauna, at least that's what I call them. This, this, is, this is also part of the inconvenient truth about so-called stream restorations and their collateral damage. These are just some examples of the plants and animals that are destroyed because they can't run faster than the bulldozers. These are all native to Maryland. I took them on my property in Montgomery County, and I'll just point to the uh, baby box turtle. The, the, look at the, the box that I circled, the red box on the left. It's about the size of a quarter, and not even the adult in the photo above it cannot run a bulldozer. And along, along with these are the thousands of understory shrubs and smaller trees that are destroyed by stream restorations along with all their mycorrhizal fungal interconnections. The native fauna and flora that are found along even degraded streams should be protected, not bulldozed. And we can't take comfort from the words of the Gaithersburg official who, who told me, oh, they'll just move away and come back after the construction, right? What happens to the fish? Nothing good. These are pictures of, of fish just uh, that are found in Montgomery County. And even if they even if they survive a stream restoration, and that's a big if, it's impossible for some of them to move over the rock dams uh, created in some of these that I showed earlier, but it gets worse. This is um, back to the Falls Reach project. Uh, like, a lot of, like a lot of these projects, the entire Falls Reach stream was pumped through the black pipe during construction. And according to a USDA, uh, USDA U.S. Department of Agriculture Natural Engineering Handbook called Stream Restoration Design, quote, aquatic life would be either prevented from passing the project reach or pulverized by the pun pumps, unquote. So this is basically one huge basomatic, to borrow a, a Saturday Night Live bit. Aquatic life pulverized by the pumps. So not just the fish, but the frogs, the crayfish, the northern um, water snakes, the baby snapping turtles, the spotted turtles, and so on and so on. Stream restorations cut forests. And I'm pretty sure all, all the people on this call know that cutting forests promotes global warming. We point, you know, we point our finger at Brazil for, for cutting their forests, but we're doing the same thing right here in Maryland. For the entire state of Maryland, I'm using the figure, the state's own figure of 105,000 feet of stream destroyed from 2014 through 2020 for stream restorations. I estimate that approximately 6 million square feet of forest has been destroyed. And the Columbia um, Lake Elkhorn project by itself, at least the proposed project, could, could double that figure by itself. The undisputed science of climate change tells us that cutting forests contributes to global warming since the trees can no longer absorb carbon dioxide, which is called carbon sequestration. And then there are the additional lost ecosystem services that are never even considered when forest areas are destroyed for a so-called stream restoration. These are, these are part of an, these are an ignored part, the ignored collateral damage of the total environmental impact. So other lost ecosystem services of a forest are things like oxygen production, lost stormwater absorption, lost biodiversity, especially compared to, especially compared to what's plant replanted, lost native plants that insects eat, and the lost insects that birds depend on, and the lost wildlife habitat, just to give some example. And of course, the loss of the small animals, like the frogs, the toads, the turtles that are killed on site. And what is really shocking is that, according to Dr. Sujay Kashal at the University of Maryland, no one has ever studied or calculated the total environmental impact of so-called stream restorations or, com or compared their environmental impact to the alternative, non-destructive upland stormwater control practice. And by total um, impact, I mean the, the total lost ecosystem services of both the in-stream and riparian areas, not just measuring the fish and invertebrates in the stream itself, which is really the only biological component of stream restoration that's being considered to date, although not being required by the MS4 permit. So, you know, you all probably know that the fall uh, 2021 a climate change summit in Glasgow, global leaders committed to halt deforestation. How are we supposed to fight global warming when stream restorations are cutting down our forests? 
Uh, what will, so what will, what will be the impact of climate change on stream restorations? Well, the science says that stream restorations will cause more intense rainstorms in our area, the mid-Atlantic. And with these larger storms, if the stormwater isn't controlled in developed areas, it will continue to fire hose indoor streams and cause even more erosion. And certainly these larger storm events will and currently do blow out stream restoration projects. Some jurisdictions and industry representatives say that stream restorations are cheaper and that upland stormwater control is just too expensive. Um, jurisdictions say they're being forced to do stream restorations because they get more MS4 permit credits from, from MDE. But I recently was made aware of a 2018 letter from MDE to the Maryland Association of Counties saying that since the counties themselves asked for more stream restoration credits, that wish was being granted by MDE. So the counties can't blame MDE for giving too many credits for storm restorations. That's exactly what the counties have asked for. So we need to tell our elected representatives and the Columbia Association Board that our few remaining natural areas are priceless, even if they aren't in pristine condition. And saving our natural areas outweighs any money savings, as the graphic suggests. We, should, we, we all should be willing to pay more for non-destructive stormwater control, control practices done outside streams protect, to protect our few remaining natural areas. So what, do, what does the scientific literature say about the effect of stream restorations on stream biology? The literature shows that the results of stream restorations rarely, if ever, show evidence for biological improvements for aquatic organisms. The Fish and Wildlife Service sent a comment letter about the Columbia project in which they say that when a project's location is dominated by urban land use, its biological restoration potential will be limited. As part of their greenwashing campaign, stream restoration companies and jurisdiction, jurisdictions, they tout the ecological restoration benefits, but that is simply not borne out by the science. And these pictures at the bottom are just a few examples of the aquatic org organisms that are measured, either the benthic macro and invertebrates or the fish. Again, no research has ever been done on the total environmental damage and loss of ecosystem services as a result of stream restorations. And by that, by that, that I mean both the in-stream and the stream side um, uh, areas, especially when compared to out-of-stream stormwater control practices. Allowing these so-called stream restoration to continue is like doing a vaccine without doing clinical trials. During a stream restoration webinar, webinar that I, I, I uh, went to last week, an industry practitioner from a major stream restoration company admitted that stream restorations are not resulting in ecological uplift. His proposed solution, if, if you can believe it, was that we should continue doing stream restoration and just lower our expectations. <laughs> That's great. If you're losing, just declare, declare victory and go home. These are the papers for your future reference that I referenced uh, to back up my statements in the previous slide. So what exactly are the non-destructive upland, uh, meaning out of stream valley, alternatives to stream restorations. To understand the importance of stream restoration, stream restoration alternatives, first we have to appreciate the root cause of major stream erosion, which is, as I've been saying, stormwater from impervious services like ro uh, roofs and roads. So this slide shows how uncontrolled stormwater from roofs and roads, for example, flows into storm drains in the middle picture, and then fire hoses through stormwater pipes and into our streams. Stream restorations do nothing can, to control this stormwater volume before it gets into the streams. So what exactly are the alternatives to stream restorations? All of the alternatives are included in MDE's accounting guidance document, as it's commonly known. This is the cover page. I've got a link. You can look at it for yourselves. This gives quite a long list of alternative non-destructive practices, as they're called, that can be used instead of stream restorations to control stormwater and meet the MS4 permit. And I'll show you um, what these are in the next couple of slides. And I don't expect you to read these, and I'm not gonna go over these, but I just wanna show you that these, the counting guidance has these tables and it gives all of the practices for non-destructive stormwater control. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, all of these are non-destructive alternatives. The only destructive practice out of all of these several dozen practices is stream, stream restoration, 
pointed to by the red arrow, which I call the nuclear option. So this is a continuation, another table from the accounting, accounting guidance document that lists the, uh, more non-destructive practices to control stormwater outside of streams. So the point is there are dozens of non-destructive alternatives to fix the problem of stormwater eroding streams. Um, and so I'll show you some examples, examples of what these actually look like. Um, these are pictures of non-destructive alternatives to, to stream restorations, which can control stormwater before it can even enter the streams. And that removes, this would remove the root cause of stream erosion in urban and, and suburban areas. The co-benefit is that most of these practices recharge the groundwater via soil infiltration and increase stream base flow. The upper left uh, shows a bioretention, as it's called, where the uh, cement curb is cut and the stormwater from the road is diverted into planted depressions where the stormwater soaks into the soil. And they're typically planted with, um, or can be planted, it should be planted with, with native plants. Next to it is a grass swale, which is the same thing without plants. Permeable, permeable pavement, paving is shown in the lower left. Uh, converting lawns to camp, conservation landscaping is shown in the bottom middle. And so just a little factoid, um, if lawns were considered a crop, lawn turf would be the largest crop in Maryland by area. And 95% of stormwater that falls on lawns runs off. So it's better than cement, but only 5% better. Green roofs are shown on the top right and planting trees on the bottom right. So this is just a small subset of the tables that I showed you. The added benefit of out of, out of stream or upland stormwater control is that, that they don't destroy natural areas. This is a bioretention that takes water from the parking lot and roofs at the un universities at Shady Grove in Montgomery County. Practices, practices like these are done in already, already disturbed areas like parking lots and road rights of way. And these are just some references for your few, uh, for non-destructive stormwater control practices if you ever want to read more about it later. One of the, one of the object, uh, objections from local officials and the, and the stream restoration industry is that there's simply, they say, there's simply not enough land for upland stormwater control with no, with no evidence to back that up. I don't think these folks have looked hard enough. All you have to do is open your eyes to see locations everywhere for upland stormwater control. Um, we, we just get these arm wavy, arm wavy statements that we can't possibly control all the stormwater. So let's just armor plate the streams with stream restorations. Um, my, 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 rhetor my rhetor rhetorical question is, in which watershed have you maxed out the areas in which upland stormwater contr control could be done? And the answer is none. There are no watersheds that have maxed out its potential upland stormwater control. Um, so in the middle is a potential location in, Ken in Kensington. This whole median, which slopes down towards, uh, down towards the bottom of the picture, could be a huge, beautiful bioretention filled with native plants to take water off the street. And every house could have a bioretention, a rain garden in front to take stormwater, um, stormwater runoff from the street like the uh, example images on either side. So in summary, here's a list of reasons to oppose so-called stream restorations. Stream re number one, stream restorations don't restore streams either physically or biologically. They import foreign materials such as rocks, boulders, and fill material, and they destroy riparian or stream, or stream side forests and ecosystems in their footprint. This is a complex web of, web of nature that can't be recreated by replanting a few trees. Number two, stream restorations don't address the root cause of stream bank erosion, which is stormwater fire hosing into streams from impervious services like roads and roofs. Number three, the science tells us we should protect our forested natural areas since they counteract uh, global warming by carbon sequestration, even if they aren't in pristine condition. They shouldn't be destroyed by, by uh, stream restorations. And then lastly, number four, the way to fix streams is to fix the problem at its source, to control stormwater outside of streams by non-destructive practices such as the rain gardens, bias whales, permeable pavement, tree planting, et cetera. So my message is you can stop the destruction. Citizen, act, citizen, citizen activists like you can stop the destruction. And just to give an example, 
and just to save time, I won't read it, but, but citizen, citizen activists called their elected representatives in Alexandria and were able to stop, at least for now, a couple of proposed stream restoration projects. Um, so finally, my call to action is to do two things. One, contact your local officials at all, all levels of government, city, county, if you live in one, state, federal, asking them to ban these so-called stream restorations. And you should feel free to contact all of your state dele delegates and senators if you want, not just your own. And you can Google your own county, uh, uh, for your own county um, and, and city and find emails and phone numbers for your local, local officials. And number two, of a more urgent nature, um, you should ask the Columbia Association, uh, their board and the Columbia, Columbia Village boards to back out of its agreement, which they can do for the Lake Elkhorn Stream Restoration Project um, with the vendor. The plan is not finalized, but it, but it could destroy up to 133 acres of forest. And you can just Google Columbia Association I use the links that I have, or if you want to contact me directly, I can give you. It's a pretty long list of all of the um, all of their officials. So, with that, I'm happy to take questions. There's a, a lot of interest and support in those kind of small uh, mini projects you're talking about, the upland free storm water projects. Are you familiar with the Oregon Avenue watershed green streets in DC? No, I'm not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, this is Carolyn Mitchell, and that was a project that um, we did with DC and DOE, and their mandate is to meet their um, MS4, but also Clean Water Act requirements, and they were in the middle of planning a giant destructive tunnel to um, capture stormwater, and they actually convinced EPA that instead they could do green infrastructure, so they really are under the the gun to figure out how to make green infrastructure work. And that's green streets. It's all of those measures that you were showing by a retention. And um, so the project that I was involved with the Oregon Avenue green streets was to look at the whole watershed of a couple of stream segments going into Rock Creek Park and figure out how we could get as many gallons of stormwater retained before it got into the streams. And so, then, and, and the objective is, is BC DOT was to mass produce these, not just do a couple of little bioretentions, but do as many as we could. And um, New York City also does that. They have a, like a machine where for installing as much bioretention in the streetscapes as possible. So in those places and jurisdictions where they have figured out that this really does work and it's really um, possible, um, as long as you don't treat it as a, you know, a, a dainty um, little garden project, you know, these kinds of measures can really be very effective and compete well with these big, yeah. thank awful you. things. Thank so you, thanks, that's, Ken. That's very hopeful. Uh, it's wonderful to hear about a, a project that's successful. I appreciate that. We have so many comments. I just want to get to a couple more. Um, one, this is from uh, Gary Schmidt. Would you, Kim, would you anticipate any environmental damage from daylighting a stream, for example? Um, no, I, I love daylighting products, but again, just to reemphasize and maybe didn't make it clear, um, daylighting is wonderful. It has nothing, it's, it's not considered a stream restoration project um, by MDE. You can, you can do all the daylighting projects you want, and I would love to see all the daylighting projects um, done, but that's not a stream restoration. Um, it's, it's great to do, and if you, if you do it, you do not get credit for it as a stream restoration. I don't see any, I don't see any downside. I, you know, I love them. And uh, do you have photographs or monitoring of uh, multiple years after a project is finished? Well, I've pretty much shown the, the pictures that I have. I've only been in this for a couple of years. Um, the, let, me, let me comment on that. And you can go on, on the site and, and, and on the various counties' websites, and you can go to see their pictures. The point I would make is it doesn't really matter what it looks like year after year after year. The point is not what you, know, what you think it looks like or what I think it looks like. The point is, what is the environmental destruction that's done? You know, some, a, 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 a person could, could come upon a site 10 years later and say, oh, it looks nice. It's got all the trees, 
you know, it's got another story. It doesn't matter. You've totally destroyed the existing forest and you've lost all of that car carbon sequestration. And the point is that you could have avoid avoided doing that whole project if you had controlled the stormwater, you know, with these upland projects like the bioswales, the rain gardens, and so on and so on. And Michael Gildia has a similar point saying that it's not, uh, what you need to consider is the soil biology, the ecology of the soil is dependent on the cover. So when you see the cover supposedly recreated, you are not recreating the ecology of the soil, you're not re recreating the ecology of the stream. Just to emphasize the point that I know you've made very well. Thank you. Thanks. I see John Parrish has his hand. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Ken. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on uh, some of the people that were in the chat were talking about invasive species in the aftermath of the, well, before and after stream restoration. So I just want to comment on that because I've had firsthand experience uh, with stream restoration projects in Montgomery County, but I, I just like to cite one in particular that's close to my home in the Sligo Creek watershed. And that's the, the Breewood tributary in the upper part of the watershed. Um, before the restoration, the site certainly was not pristine, but it was wooded. Most of it was wooded yeah. to the stream bank and the, the stream channel as your picture shared was had a, a deep ravine in it. Um, there were invasive species present there, but due to the shading and the long-term relative stability outside the eroded channel, there weren't that, you know, it wasn't overrun by invasive plants. Today, I don't know what's it been, like eight years later after the stream restoration, the plant, the, the plants that occur there that are mostly invasive vines, Asiatic bittersweet, porcelain berry, mile a minute. And uh, my wife and I have gone there just taking it upon ourselves to go there and free up all the trees that were planted as a part of this restoration to keep the vines from smothering them there. So we go in there um, about twice a year. Um, we do a wintertime uh, cut to, to, to free the trees and then we do one later on in the season to try to keep up. There is, you know, a few hundred trees that were planted in this stream area. So the bottom line is that what I've witnessed is lack of um, not just in this site, but other sites, a lack of follow-up after the, the plants were planted. And in this case, if we weren't doing that work, those trees would not survive. I mean, we went in there, so many of the trees that did not survive we, because we didn't get to them in time. So whenever you clear out a corridor like that, it's just a recipe for disaster for mile a minute, um, microstigium and everything else. And that's exactly what what's happened in that corridor. So anyway, that, that, thank you for your presentation, Ken. Yeah, yeah thanks, John. That's, I mean, I, excellent comments. I, uh, that's just a pile on, at least an, another, you know, another reason for why we shouldn't be doing these projects because there, there, there is not the follow-up to control the invasives. Um, and just as, as an aside, the, the proposed Lake Elkhorn project, uh, the prospectus or the, the draft proposal has a has a line item saying, well, yeah, you know, we'll control the invasives. No, they won't. No, I mean, it'll, that would be the first history in the project of you know the first project in the history of stream restorations where anyone ever controlled the invasives. I mean, they they'll they'll go through for maybe a year or so afterwards. Maybe it's three years and they'll cut the vines. But after that, it's it, all these sites get trashed. So thanks, John. Uh, one further question: Is this a, a predominantly a regional practice? Is this a national practice? Um, it's certainly a practice in the, well, it's a national practice. It's a national practice. Um, it's, it's being done all over the country. And do you know any other um, active local organizations that are, have been successful in fighting back these kind of things? The only ones that I know of, and I'm, I'm just getting involved in this, um, would be the, uh, the, 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 uh, um, it, it, if you, you'll after I close my down, you'll re refer back to the slide about um, Alexandria. Um, and uh, so when you when you go back and look at this, uh, uh, they, they it, it takes citizens to get riled up and to write um, and call their elected representatives. That's elected representatives 
um, that's where the buck stops. I mean, it's not, you know, the, like in Montgomery County, it's not, if, if, if our executive Elrich wanted to put a stop to these things, he could. I'm disappointed that he uh, has not so far, but um, it, it takes people calling and writing their um, elected representatives. Um, we have a question out of Colette County. You have your hand raised. You want to go ahead and unmute? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I live on a hillside condominium property, which has a severe outfall problem. Um, the outfall drains water from the built from the already built community outside of the condominium as well as from the condominium and over the past years um, it's created extensive erosion a large circle of erosion around the outfall spot um, it is supposed to be on the county's list for repair uh, but the other th factor is that this outfall drains into a small tributary of Little Falls Creek. So it's surrounded by forest. Um, I'm afraid that the damage is going to be severe. I greatly appreciate the information you've provided about the, 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 the time limits to so-called restoration. Um, and I'm stumped as to how um, upstream bioretention could be done because it needs to involve a neighborhood full of paved streets and sidewalks, as well as the condominium property, which has significant forest land on it already. Um, so I don't know if you have any suggestions. I will uh, be very interested in looking at the references you've posted. And um, if you don't mind, I would perhaps like to contact you directly and see what help you could give me to advise my community on the best way to go about it. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you or anyone else who wants to contact me about specific issues or just in, in general about anything. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm under no illusion that this is an easy problem. It's gonna take to control the stormwater, you know, upland as they call it, you know, out of the stream valley, it's gonna take you know, many, 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 many um, bioretentions, bios, swales all over the place, parking lots. Um, it's, 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 not an, it's not an easy problem and it's not a fast problem. It's not gonna be a cheap problem. But the point is, you know, we should be willing to spend more money than to have these bulldozers running into our, uh, our, our streams. Right. Yeah, thank you. In Montgomery County, we have a, an election coming up. Okay. All right, do you have any thoughts about the candidates there as far as their Ecological bona fides. Uh, I do have thoughts, but I, I don't think it would be appropriate to, okay. <laughs> to, I, to get into that at, at, at this meeting. Open it up. And, yeah. Okay. You can contact me afterwards yeah. if you want. <laughs> Apparently, there is some some research at Utah State University about using beavers for restoration. Are you, have you heard about that? That that, that is a thing. That it is, is that is that is real. Um, and the and the idea is that. Um, Beavers, uh, um, beaver dams, uh, you know, the water backs up, it slows the water down, uh, you know, nutrients drop. Um, so there, there is a group uh, that's, two things are happening. One, there's a group that's trying to get um, the use of beavers as a way to get uh, MS4 permit credit. <laughs> so it's a real thing. Um, what people have done, and there's, a, I actually attended a, a, a webinar on this. They, they, this, this, this group of scientists created kind of a starter dams, like the, 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 the skeleton of a beaver dam. And I don't know if they brought in, you know, airlifted in beavers or the beavers found it, but the, the beaver is kind of, it's almost like, you know, in, in a beehive where you put down the, um, the foundation for, for a honeycomb and, and then the bees build on top of that. So the same kind of thing, they put down the foundation for a beaver dam. The beavers then expanded it and created a, a real beaver dam, and um, and uh, uh, it, it, it a lot of side benefits too in terms of um, creating um, habitat for other types of organisms that you know, evolved behind beaver dams. But no, that's a real thing. We do seem to have some guests here from industry. 
um, in particular from Ecotone. Are you familiar with that company? Oh, I am. So um, they are well, asking that uh, a more balanced view be presented, which I'm sure is typical of the ask. Okay, let me let me comment on that. Um, I wish I wish that the industry during their presentations would give a more balanced view. I mean, I, I'm not going to, I won't gild the lily here. The, the presentations from the stream restoration industry are, are total greenwashing snow jobs. Um, no, no, no if, ifs, ands, and buts. And, um, you know, so I'm not going to, I'm not giving, there's no such thing as a, as a balanced presentation about this. It's like, it's, you know, an analogy is like um, people who don't believe in climate change saying, well, there's a guy down at the University of Alabama, you know, one scientist out of, you know, a million that, that, that says that climate change is not a real thing. So you want to have a, you know, give him equal time and have a presentate, have him give a presentation to present his side. I'm sorry, that's, that's not the way it works. So, so you guys go ahead and do your thing, you know, and, and uh, I'll try and present the real story here. Any final thoughts? Can you leave us with something hopeful, Ken? Well, uh, the hope is that we, we, we know the fix. Um, I, I'm in Montgomery County, so, I, so I, you know, I'm a little Montgomery County heavy here in, what I, in my knowledge, but our, our DEP, they know how to do the, 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 the upland projects, the, the bioswales, the bioretentions, the permeable paving. And, they, and when they do it, they do a great job. Um, and they're, you know, they're good people. Um, they just need to you know, increase the, the use of those projects by orders of magnitude. So um, I know I come hard down hard on, on uh, the proponents in, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the, the county departments, um, but you know, this, is, this is one area where just, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. And hopefully you know, the, the bottom line is that the, 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 the citizenry, the residents and, and the citizens should have the final say of how we want our, our tax money spent. I mean, these are, these are not cheap things. Montgomery County spent I mean, close to $20 million for the last MS4 permit just on stream restorations. They're slated to spend, I think, another $20 million on our next MS4 permit project. But they're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And we should tell our elected representatives how we want our money spent. Thank you. Thank you.